Welcome at uh, the Artist Talk, the side event on the Conference of the European Union on building the future of Syria and the region. And we have the pleasure today to have an Artist Talk with uh, Sulafa Hijazi and Kinan Azmi. And we will discuss uh, new events in the artistic scene with regard to Syria and broader. And um, it's quite a pleasure to have this talk because there's so much going on with regard to Syria, but the arts haven't always been like on the forefront. And nevertheless, it's very important to discuss this because since the outburst of the protest movement in Syria, there has been a lot going on with regard to artistic production. Syrian arts have always been very important, but they haven't always been internationally very known and people didn't know what was going on in the very rich artistic scene. And since 2011, there's an immense interest and we can discuss if that interest after decades of underrepresentation maybe is the, isn't a bit too much now that there's a lot of discussion on Syrian arts and war arts and that artists also like to be addressed as artists rather than as people who have to express something on a, a political situation. So today we will talk about renewal in arts, but also on the artistic expression of uh, both Sinan, uh, both Kinan rather, and Sulafa. And we would also like to stress that uh, they are not representatives of the Syrian artists, but they are rather two artists who happen to come from Syria and who happen to be also um, universalist people who travel, who are based in Berlin, in New York, who have the world and Syria inside of them and who like to also express that in their arts. So we're ha very happy to have you here today with us virtually, Kinan and Sulafa. Kinan on this very early time of the day for you okay. in New York and Sulafa from Berlin. Hi. Welcome. Um, Thank you. <laughs> it's, um, a lot to discuss, uh, I think, in quite a short time, but maybe it's just nice to start uh, as a way of introduction with um, what, you're how, what you're working on right now and, of course, where you're coming from. Uh, Sulafa, you're a visual artist, a multimedia artist, and you have for a long time been working on uh, animation, children's animation, uh, even launching a satellite uh, station for children. So. Your artwork is very much inspired by that fantasy, let's say, but it's also inspired by politics, by life as it happens to be, uh, not always like in a fairy tale. And your artistic expression is also quite critical and also forced you to, to leave Syria. Um, maybe just um, to know how did the events in Syria influence your work? after having left it in 2011? Um, uh, first, hi, Projet, and hi, Kinan. It's been like since 2013 when I left Syria to come to, uh, to the US. And uh, for sure, in those times, there were lots of uh, international changes in the world in general, and also some personal changes. Um, I studied, for example, conceptual art in, um, in Frankfurt, which has uh, for somehow affected my art practice. Before I was working a lot with animation and um, uh, digital art, so I start to mix between uh, conceptual and multimedia arts. Um, in the same time, also they were like, the technology is my medium, like computer and digital is my medium. And uh, uh, there's always up to date uh, things with the technology that they inspire you as an artist. And uh, with the different places that you travel or even being in Berlin, like the center of, uh, there's like a big hub of digital art going on. So for sure it will affect somehow your art, uh, uh, your art practice in, in the technique, in the medium itself. Um, when we talk about the subjects, um, it's also, I feel like from 2011 till now, it's not only in Syria internationally, and maybe because of the present of the social media, there were lots of open uh, uh, topics and lots of taboos used to, like lots of subjects that they used to be taboos. They are start to be addressed publicly. Uh, I feel like the, the, self ex the freedom of self-expression in general has been raised. Um, um, 
so this collective, let's say, um, uh, uh, collective way of being more open to, to lots of taboos in self-expression is also affected me as a person. So I feel like I can maybe more speak freely about topics that I was not able to be, uh, to speak about before. Um, part of it for sure, it's that when you, when uh, the political, uh, uh, when you are against this political regime or when you are like protesting and trying to break some taboos politically. So in your way, you break many other taboos socially, religionally, even like your personal, your own personal way of dealing with life and stuff. So all this social, political, even digital, whatever changes for sure, it will affect uh, my, my art to practice somehow. Mm. Thank you. Kinan, I would like to also introduce you properly and ask you the same question. You are um, based for quite some time in New York now, working as a composer and a clarinetist. And um, you've also been very renowned in the sense that you've traveled worldwide, working also in the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, working for the Western Eastern uh, Diwan Orchestra. So. Bavaria Radio Orchestra. So you have done a lot of work both in, like say, traditional classical music and also contemporary um, music. And what struck me is also that um, dialogue is a recurrent issue in your work. You've established uh, the group Hewar, uh, meaning dialogue, and also working on, on contemporary Arab music. So it seems that in your work, what is recurrent is the idea also of traveling, of being a person of the world, let's say, but also establishing links uh, in between cultures. Um, is that something that you're also working on now or is that something that you've always carried with you? Uh, again, good morning, Bridget. Good morning, Sarafa. Uh, hello from New York, 3.30 in the morning. Um, I, yes, actually, oh, thank you for the introduction, Bridget. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, I'm a musician, I'm a clarinetist, and the clarinet is a single voiced instrument, which means it's an instrument that lend, lends itself very easily to, for collaboration. So I'm a collaborator by nature, and, uh, and I play often with other musicians, and I try always to expand these territories to include people who do other type of arts. So I always collaborate with contemporary dancers, uh, with uh, visual artists, uh, filmmakers, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I don't think, let me actually reverse the order of the question. Uh, what I'm working on right now is actually a continuation of what I've been working on since I became a professional musician, which is uh, many years ago, uh, which is to compose, uh, to collaborate, uh, and to play. And by doing so, I think I touch on all the things that I like to do. I always, you know, every time when I think about the art I make, I always like to bring uh, the idea of pleasure to the mix. Uh, pleasure being a very noble wor word or noble sentiment to have. Uh, I do what I like to do. And I think I'm incredibly lucky to be, to be in that situation. Uh, because again, also Sulafa mentioned on this, it's about self-expression, having the freedom to self-express in a very abstract medium. Music might be one of the most abstract mediums, especially when you're talking about music that doesn't have lyrics uh, connected to it. And, uh, and I happen, I grew up in a, in a family that is, uh, you know, tried to expose my sister and I to a variety of cultures. Uh, yes, I grew up listen, uh, listening to Bach, Mozart, Brahms, and Beethoven. And that's what I grew up studying also. But in the meantime, I grew up in a city like Damascus where, uh, you know, there are lots of, uh, if you hear actually explosions, these are the fireworks right outside uh, Brooklyn. They're happening, uh, happening daily. So don't be alarmed. Uh, and... Uh, and so I grew up listening to lots of other music so that we, we had at home, but also being in Damascus, a city that is quite diverse musically. Uh, in music, it's very, you know, in Damascus, it's very often that you listen to music, you know, uh, Arabic music, of course, uh, Kurdish music, Armenian music, uh, ancient Aramaic music, or ancient Syriac music, uh, rather. So that was part of the cultural mix that I grew up with. And I moved to New York in 2000, 
actually, uh, to pursue my higher education. And New York is a city similar to how Berlin is and Brussels and, you know, the big cities where being multicultural is, is the norm, actually. It's, uh, you cannot filter out things. So I guess the things that I get exposed to and the collaborators that I collaborate with, somehow uh, they re-manifest in the work I do. So now I try to describe the work I do uh, beyond genre in a way, if I can. You know, it's always people always want to categorize stuff like he's a classical musician, he's a pop artist. And I always think that art should be something larger than this. In the sense, uh, for me, it continues to be a very basic formula uh, doing, doing art, which is uh, I have an idea in my head. I have a tool to use, which is the clarinet in my case. And I have the skills to use the tool to say what, what, what I want to say. So for me, and when, when you do that uh, and, being, uh, and paying attention to what surrounds you, and if you're socially and politically aware, also your relationship with the world can be uh, summarized. It doesn't have to because the artist should have the freedom also of not choosing not to. But the world or your view of the world reflect in the, in the work you do. And that's what I think I'm trying to do. Sorry, that was a long answer to your question. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, I will just uh, stay with you um, for a minute because I wanted to maybe also, um, when you talk about expressing um, your view on the world, I would also like to touch upon the question of expressing grief. How do you express grief and um, I suppose the, the grief that, that you have for what Sulafa said is broader than Syria, the loss of humanity that we are seeing as a worldwide trend, maybe to put it a bit dramatically, but how do you deal with that, the loss of humanity in your work? Yeah, you know, I think you'll be putting too much burden on the artist or on the art itself if you wanted to summarize an emotion that you can express in writing. Um, yeah, you know, there are two, two main ways of looking at the arts in general. One of them uh, suggests, like one philosophy suggests that you do art uh, to, you know, to reflect on the world around you, right? To kind of documenting the time. And other people suggest that uh, you do art to recreate the world in the most ideal way, according to the artist. And my personal uh, feeling has been for many years that uh, you do art to experience emotions that you did not have the luxury of experiencing in real life, to go what is beyond. So I don't think actually I play music to express or to summarize an emotion that is available. What I'm more interested in as an artist is to dig deeper in my soul somehow, to, to find emotions that I, that I haven't reconciled with maybe, or even an emotion that I didn't simply uh, uh, experienced before. I mean, to give you a very small example, uh, the Syrian uprising began 2011, and I simply was not able to write music for a year, uh, just simply because I was, I was thinking about mirroring the time and trying to see how I can document the time. But what interested me most and what I felt was like, this is not for me, it's not the time for me to be to be creative, this is, I have a new feeling in me and I want to know what it is. And I, I didn't have that feeling before. So it took me a year to be able to address it. And uh, when I was addressing it, for me, it was very therapeutical actually to write music again, Espe especially realizing that the, you know, playing music and uh, writing music and playing the clarinet is my main soul of expression. And, and if you think of the uprising in 2011 as people want going to the streets to express an opinion, so might as well also, I have the luxury of doing that, so I should do it as much as possible. So that's why I started writing again, uh, writing again 2011, but I, uh, 2012. Um, but I think art, again, should give us uh, open doors for emotions that are more complex than emotion that we can describe in language. So I don't expect an artwork to summarize grief. The most artwork that actually interests me the most are ones that are too complex 
to be summarized by, by a single word. And I think that's why we go and see art, because suddenly it surprises us of like how complex life can be. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Uh, Sulafa, how do you relate to that, uh, to art and of jumping into a world, more complex world and jumping into more complex emotions? Um, yeah, for sure. I like actually a lot what uh, Kinan said about the undescribed emotion. Uh, also with my art, it's a lot about layers. It's not a statement that you can write on a Facebook and you can say something about it and then like, you can get, uh, get it immediately. It's about the layers uh, that had many different ways to be read. Uh, uh, something also about the Syrian art, for example, when we summarize the Syrian art, we always say we and you. Uh, we as a Syrian artist want to tell you our story. Or, you know, like this dualism, I think it's, it's flattening the, uh, the core of the art that I see. Uh, when I work with art, I talk to, I make communication with the human being. Uh, we all, for example, have fears. We all have grief. We all have um, uh, complex emotions. We all do the same. We have the same language of uh, feeling and dealing with world. Maybe my culture or another person's culture or personal experiences, let them express it in their own way. But in the deep down, it's a human communication. Um, and this when we se uh, separated, for example, between media and art. Uh, media um, deal with people as a collective identities. So they tell you the, the Lebanese army, the Syrian army, the, they deal with people as collective identities and within this framework of their uh, culture or whatever identity represents the political or religion or, but I think art is going beyond those um, defined framework of identities and they speak with the human on a deepest level and it's beyond this uh, a definition like ready definition of what is identity means and stuff. Uh, so I think in my art is mostly like open questions, but it's my own question also. Sometimes I don't have an answer actually. Sometimes I just put comp compositions between things that I feel they created a nice similarity, like this one for example, it's like the embroidery and the QR codes. It's, it's create like, I like this composition that creates and the many questions that can uh, being addressed within it. So it's more like an open question or more an open research with the, with the technique itself or with the subject itself or with the imagination that it creates more than like, uh, this is my statement. I want to say this or, or to flatten it is in one speech direction speech. So yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more because I was looking at the embroidery while you were talking and Embroidery is, of course, very important. It also tells tales. The narration in embroidery is, is very important and it also travels. So I was wondering what the artwork means or uh, what you want to convey with it. Um, uh, as I say, it's like this composition um, um, to, to make this idea of comparison between the embroidery as a local heritage that has codec and symbolic, it stays a story actually. And the digital culture with the QR codes as also a collective identity. Where are we between those scales of defining ourselves and what are symbols that presenting us? Um, what does the codec means to us? And what is the first impression that you have when you see a codec and what do you relate to personally? So it has many of those layers. And even if you see it, they are interactive. So each one of them, they tell a story um, and the, the patterns itself, it's create one narrative and each pattern itself, it's create another narrative. So it's kind of a research work or let's say something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It's very nice because it's so recurrent, uh, the, the tales of embroidery and indeed the heritage of embroidery that, uh, that travels with it. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to talk a bit more about heritage also like of course there's a lot of destruction in Syria and destruction of, of heritage but there's also a lot of renewal and uh, also people like Kinan and yourself and so many other artists are working on that renewal of arts visual arts narrative arts in so many domains so I, I would like to hear from both of you like where you see renewal, it can be in Syrian art or more broadly, but what is really inspiring for you today? 
You go? Yeah. <laughs> you uh, okay, go. I go. Okay. Um, you, you know, it's, uh, there's something interesting. I'm sorry, I'm diverting a little bit in the conversation. But, uh, and I think you did that in your introduction, Bridget, about, you know, what is Syrian art, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, you know, at this point in the conversation, we need to address that. It's, uh, it's basically the elephant in the room. Mm. Um, I mean, for me now, the, the way I look at, at Syrian art is, is basically a collective of whatever Syria or people who, who did cross path with actually Syria for a long term, people who dug vertically in what it offers and interacted with its people at any time of their life, you know, past, present and future. Uh, collectively, that's what can be um, Syrian art. At least this is my very humble, very simplified definition. Um, so, so looking at that, I mean, Syria, the geographical uh, Syria, did host uh, many cultures, as as we know, you know, uh, past and present, and hopefully future too. And uh, and and the heritage is incredibly rich. I personally got involved in the heritage that Syria has. Uh, after I left Syria. I think it's a classic case of uh, visiting the museum in your hometown only after you leave that hometown and when somebody is coming to visit with you, you know, and that's where you rediscover it. Um, my interest in Arabic music in general uh, came in maybe 2003 when I started the band Hiwar, uh, where the whole idea was like to dialogue with people because I think dialogue is an incredible form of learning something. And uh, through this band, uh, I learned from my colleagues in the band about, you know, about the heritage, basically, of Arabic music, how it's present and practiced in, in a country like Syria. Um, now looking, of course, it's, it's with heavy heart, you know, seeing what happened to the, to, the, to the heritage. Of course, I'm talking about the physical heritage that, you know, all the monuments that simply disappeared, uh, the spoken and sung heritage, all the music of, that communities carried for centuries that also are, you know, simply stopped being practiced. But I think, I think the, the, worst, the worst thing is by far is the loss of the human heritage, you know, the displacement and the, and the, and the trauma. I mean, of course, in, like, you know, we both know this, so I, I don't need to, to dwell uh, into it. Uh, and, and for me, the, the work I'm trying to do, I'm trying to not be in a survival mode, meaning I'm trying to, to still to, to think of myself as an artist who's doing art for art's sake. I know it's not completely true because I know that I'm so much involved emotionally, uh, but that's what I try, try to do because I think it's linked incredibly well with your idea of identity. What is, what is identity, you know? And, um, and protecting that heritage, that collective heritage is part of you trying to protect or emphasize an identity. And when it comes to identity, again, you know, there are people who think, uh, you know, uh, home is the place that you, you grew up with and where you have memories uh, from. And some other people think that home is the place where that offers you the math, uh, the, you know, the most. Uh, it can be anywhere, anywhere else in the world in a very pragmatic situation. And for me, home is the place where you'd like to contribute to without having to justify it. And when you think of home like this, contributing to protecting a heritage, for me is, is a definition of home. So for me, I'm interested now more, more and more with what Syria produces artistically. Uh, one of my last projects, was uh, setting music by 15 Syrian poets, uh, setting uh, poems by 15 Syrian poets to music. And I'm somebody who grew up not even uh, reading poetry. I was not interested in poetry. Uh, even the famous songs that we used to hear growing up, you know, all the Beatles songs and Elvis and Metallica and all the rock and roll, I never paid attention to lyrics. Suddenly, and because of what you said also, Sulafa, I think there was a sudden change of context and what people were writing. Suddenly there, uh, there are all these incredible poetry that is written about uh, God or the lack of, uh, 
about uh, democracy, about uh, uh, gender topics, all of this suddenly became at the forefront of what Syria is producing. And this is, I think, is the new heritage too. And of course, I, I, you know, I discovered how lucky I am to be surrounded by 15 friends who are poets, which is like an incredible situation to be at. So for me, that's my connection with, with uh, what Syria is producing right now and being part of that heritage. Thank you. Um, it's good that you dwelled on the, the elephant in the room because it is indeed important when we talk about Syrian art to define more sharply what we want to discuss and because of course there's so much evolutions that have happened over the last years and of course there's sometimes a bit of um, frustration among artists when we use these kind of container concepts um, but I would like to hear from you Sulafa how you relate to that to that image indeed of this transnational uh, transnational Syrian community that does indeed reinvent itself and produces things which have been unseen until today. Uh, produces, uh, sorry, the, the community has been produced. Can you? Uh, can you it produces that? artistic production, which is really quite novel, not only relating to the heritage, but also shaping new expressions which haven't been seen before the protest movement, let's say. Yeah, you mean within the community, within like, you mean within the Syrian community, for example? Yes, and also the the new community, because of course the community as it was in 2011 has traveled, has been expelled, has um, some people cut off contact, other people indeed uh, didn't, but always refer of course to Syria, but we can't talk about one community, but it is indeed a lot of people referring to the Syrian artist community and being part of it but having very different visions on what it exactly looks like or what Syrian arts is exactly today. Yeah, it's, um, when, I, when I hear the word community is a little bit problematic for me because I have Syrian art friends and it happens to be Syrian artists, but we're not a community. Uh, I have also other artists, friends from different nationalities and stuff, you know. Um, it's also good to go back to the elephant of the room, maybe. <laughs> it's a nice expression, <laughs> you know. Uh, like what a Syrian art means. I was in a conversation with my, with a mutual French, actually a mutual friend of me and uh, Kinan, his name is Ziad Adwan. And we were talking about this topic of the Syrian art. And we were thinking like, when do we say this is a Syrian art? Does it, if it's a Syrian artist, any Syrian artist do art will consider a Syrian art? Uh, uh, if a Syrian artist talk about Guatemala, does it consider it a Syrian art? If an American artist talk about Syria, does it consider it a Syrian art? Uh, if, uh, uh, if a Syrian artist has been born and raised in a different country, does it consider it a Syrian art? So it's a very problematic topic. Why we, do we say now a Syrian art and we don't say the American art or, you know, like, um, it's, it's a very wide abroad and even within the artist who happens to be in Syria, they have different kind of uh, um, uh, ways, development paths, and different kind of experience that lead them to express themselves in a different way um, within this, uh, this framework of what is it to, to be a Syrian artist. So it's, it's also a question for us actually, like what does it mean to be? For sure, at some point, we shared uh, similar experiences. We have some similar experiences, but we also have some different experiences in life also. Uh, we, we also want, I want to say something that Syria, like my grandmother is older than Syria. Syria as a concept is like only um, has been established politically in the border in the 20s. So before that, it was even a different country. So to relate also to this political borders is a very few, it's limiting me sometimes. Um, for sure, I grew up there and I have many um, memories and I shared uh, lots of uh, uh, influence from a lot of culture and the, the, the same what Kinan was saying, like all this multicultural that happening around us in the city, for sure you affected, <clears throat> but it's still outside this border of, uh, of, uh, of this, uh, this borders. And back to the heritage, what I like about the heritage is not the idea that it's very local, actually the idea that it's very international. Going back also to Kinan's what he said, for example, when you grow up in a country that has Armenian effects, 
uh, Assyrians, uh, Aramaic, and all this international. So you, you feel that the heritage is shaped between communication of civilizations, not of a very close border to the country. And it shows you that heritage is beyond the borders of, uh, of uh, the political borders. It's more of a uh, international human communication that created this kind of, uh, of heritage in different, in different ways. I'm researching actually of one of my projects I'm doing now of Talsimans, the, the magic in the, in the Arabic, in the Islamic culture. And when I was trying to read the simple like of the tal Talsimans, Talasim, is it Talsimans, uh, Kinan? Uh, Talismans, yeah. Talismans, yeah. Okay. yeah. And when I was trying to read into these talismans, I just found, because for me, it was all, always um, a local whatever heritage that I don't understand well, but when I see it, I can relate to the, to the country or something. But I was dipping more into this, let's say, heritage or folk, uh, I will say it, art form, for example, even if it has some, uh, some kind of religious uh, uh, narrative. Uh, I found like most some of them are taken from India, for example, from the Indian letters. Some of, of them are using um, logarithmic uh, mathematical patterns that were taken from far Asia. So all this kind of communication between uh, uh, human and civilization and immigration paths in the life that shapes the heritage, this is what I love about the heritage. It's actually the collective art, let's say, the collective art uh, production, uh, let's say, about it. So, yeah, so this is beyond Syria a little bit. <laughs> it's beautiful. And on the same hand, I was wondering, well, um, for example, a case I know well, uh, Palestine, artists would often refer to themselves as Palestinian. Mahmoud Darwish would always talk uh, of himself as a Trojan poet, trying to relate to the experiences of people who have been on the side of history, which have not been represented very well, let's say, who've been glossed over by history. But that issue of being Palestinian wasn't exclusive of being a universalist person. So in that sense, I think um, claiming that Syrian um, um, concept or et etiquette, if you want, doesn't say, well, you don't belong to other communities or identities or you know, I have... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Sulafa. No, it's okay. I just want to refer for a small things, like according to this, uh, uh, for example, when I was talking to... Uh, we are located... I'm located in Berlin now. And I want to talk... When I wanted to talk about my childhood and the, that Syria was a socialist country and we raised in a certain system, they didn't know that. Most of my German friends, especially from the DDR, they thought that Syria was an Islamic country, the same case as in Iran or Saudi Arabia. But I told them, and when we shared our memories, we shared like a really similar, uh, uh, um, similar experiences with the army lessons in the school, with the intelligentsia, with the fear of the government, with, all, with even the economical situations. And when I told them also that part of our uh, regime was trained with the, with the DDR German intelligentsia, so we have this similar even identity somehow and we have in our prison uh, a torture tool it's called the german chair so it shows also this effect between like how even the socialists created like a kind of a culture heritage or identity even between countries and you see all these similarities so we are not like isolated around the world we are like part of the world and even what's happening politically is part of of this international political movements as well yeah. You know, the, the, the two things that uh, I'm loving this conversation, I didn't expect, <laughs> like, no, no, no I, I didn't expect like, <laughs> for, my, for my brain to be so awake this morning. So, uh, so thank you. 3 a.m. for you, yeah. Um, uh, I just, I, like, the two thoughts I have, uh, one of them is about the whole uh, thing, what you mentioned, uh, Sarafa, about uh, the identity as, you know, Syrian art. Yeah. Uh, I do believe we're still too close because they have not been a uh, really serious documentation of art movements. I'm, ta I'm talking about the, on the, in the current Syrian geography. And I think we're still too close in history to realize patterns, uh, interest points, or collective interest points, that is, that will define a school of art that will say this is Syrian art. You know, because now the term 
American art actually is used. You know, when you think of music, like the minimalist school, for example, uh, is, is actually a term that is used and it is, a, it is an American school. But it's only, we're, we're only, we're able to name it as such, you know, maybe, I don't know, 50 years later, I think. So I think oh, it's okay. about documenting, uh, documenting the time. So, I mean, I think we're both of you and I, Surafa, we're going to see if what we are doing ends up being in a Syrian school or if we're actually drifting on our own. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and what you mentioned, Bridget, about the identity, you brought Mahmoud Darwish as, uh, as an example. I think, and this is for me, again, uh, touches on the whole idea of home, is home the place you want to contribute to? And contributing to a place is about bringing its cause to the forefront. And, um, and by mentioning, that when, when Mahmoud Darwish mentioned that he's Palestinian, being a Palestinian is a political statement right now. You know? So when he goes on an on a uni- like international stage and you say, I'm Palestinian, it is, an, it is actually a political cause to be discussed. Uh, I would like to share a very c- short conversation that I had with a dear friend of mine and who's also a mentor, the, the wonderful uh, cellist Yo-Yo Ma. We once were doing a, a tour and we wanted to have a conversation about identity. And this is what happened. So he said, Kinan, if you fly, try to introduce yourself, what do you say? And I say, I'm a, you know, I'm a Syrian clarinetist and a composer based in New York City. For me, that's the facts of the matter. And he said, if we start from zero, like let's start back earlier in time. Uh, I said, okay, when I was a little boy, I was the young clarinetist from Damascus. That's the city where I was born and I was living. And then I grew a bit more. So I became, you know, no longer the young. I am the clarinetist in Damascus. Uh, I started to, to compose a little bit. So I became the musician from Damascus. I started to, uh, to travel abroad a little bit. So I became the Syrian musician. And so not, it's not only from Damascus now, I became the Syrian musician. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think my next goal in my identity uh, you know, levels is to become uh, the musician, right? Uh, and more so to become the artist. So to switch from the Syrian artist to the artist. And, and what he said was, was great. He said, I think there is still one, one more level to go. And that is to become a human being. You switch from being an artist to become a human being. And I think when you think about these identities, it's basically, it's like a large pyramid. It's not that you're dropping identities, like, you know, moving from being a Damascene to a Syrian and from a Syrian to an artist, and from an artist to a human. Actually, you're accumulating more and more identities. And that will give you the freedom more to relate to different causes of whatever falls under being a human being. So, uh, so yes, we are, you know, both Suraf and I are Syrian artists, but also I think we're, I don't want to, you know, speak on your behalf, no, no, Surafa, but I feel we are on the same boat in this. But we are aiming at becoming artists, but more so becoming humans and how you use your art to serve what you think. Mm-hmm. I think she agrees. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, this is a, this because this is what we say. Like when we interact as a human being, regardless to the medium that we in, interact with, art or music or whatever, or even like what kind of cultural form that shape our art. But at the end, we relate to the other to the others through our human identity more than our uh, let's say uh, political uh, frame or more than. The, 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 the already a one statement definition of ourselves. So I agree a lot with this, with this, uh, with this idea. Yeah. Because also, you know, like, like you said, how people, how they group people in one thing. I mean, if you really know, like, you know, this, this, the Syrian story right now, mm-hmm. you, you have to listen to 24 million stories by 24 million Syrians. Mm-hmm. That's the only way you can actually get a true image of what's going on. Exactly. And, uh, and trying to be, to, for us, and also you mentioned this, I think, in your introduction, Bridget, that we are not representatives. And sometimes I feel that uh, when, when I get invited as a Syrian artist, you know, lots of the time people feel they have to make that statement, which a statement nobody feels they have to do if they're introducing a French artist. Oh, you know, like, oh, this French artist actually does not represent the French, because it's obvious. And for us, it's a new territory because there's sudden attention on Syrian art in the last 10 years. 
and uh, and it's and I think all of us collectively, at least the three of us on this call, are trying to invite people to explore more art that is coming from that part of the world. You know, that's why we want to tell everybody like we are not representatives really. We are just you know three people on this call. Mm -hmm. Please check out what's you know what else is out there, kind of thing. Yes, yes, and no. I, I think I'm saying that also out of respect uh, for you, also as artists, as individuals. Um, and on the other hand, I do feel that there's a lot of burden. Like as you said, there's burden on artists because artists have a certain task and people have expectations. But there's also a burden on Syrian artists because we cannot, as an outsider who is very interested in Syria, I cannot deny the fact that. We are interested in, in knowing people's opinions and there has been a huge flare-up in new artistic expressions. I've been following the Syrian literary scene for quite a number of years, for over 20 years now. And I mean, what I've been reading the last couple of years, even before 2011, um, since uh, the beginning of 2000, etc. I mean, there's so much innovation. So in the, I think as outsiders, we are also interested, not because we want to define you to a single identity, be, but because we are truly interested in your opinions on something new, which is a complete rupture. And we cannot deny that rupture. And on the other hand, we don't always want to confront you with that rupture, be it political or artistic or, or broader. Um, personal, let's say. So I think that's why often it's difficult to have a conversation on the Syrian arts, because it's narrowing something which is impossible to narrow down. And on the other hand, it would be such a pity not to have that discussion, because people are talking about humanitarian issues at this moment, about political issues. And it's so important to talk about the arts and things which are let's say, hopefully everlasting or, or something that goes beyond the, the 12 million people who are displaced and all these numbers. Um, so that is just my, my take on why we, we, we um, cast you as people who don't represent the Syrian artist. Uh, but I also know it's Sulafa that you take issue with these with the concepts and maybe just to more or less end our conversation because I think we're nearing the end. I, I, I'm quite interested to hear maybe your opinion on, on being an artist in the diaspora who is often, I think, narrowed down to, to being a Syrian artist and how you relate to that, I think, always in a very positive way, uh, in a kind way, but very determined, I think, as well. Um, and the only thing is like when it's put you into a borders and expectations of what you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to feel or what have what you're supposed to say so it's end up another kind of oppression to the self-expression that you have when i'm being addressed at sulafa hijazi with my own experience with my own art practice i prefer it than being addressed as a syrian artist it happened that her name is sulafa hijazi so it it took my individual practice away and it's just like define me within like um, one frame rule that fixed, fit some expectations about how it's supposed to be. Um, and uh, one thing about the, the, the Syrian arts and like uh, what, why is it so important now and what is it? If we say that what's happening in Syria is part of an international political, economical, whatever situation, and it happens that this situation had fleed more than 10 million people in all over the world. So in Germany, for example, if you suddenly have an existence of 1 million or 2 million people, happens that they are coming from Syria. So for sure you will start to ask, who are they? What is it? What is it to, to be? So for sure this kind of question, it will happen because it is kind of a, 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 what's happening in Syria, it's affected the world and it's been affected by the world. So for sure we, we're gonna ask ourselves as a human, why this happening? Why all this immigration is happening? What is it going, what, what is it in this international politics that leads to all this uh, kind of immigration flow within this century that we're supposed to say that we are living in a democratical, uh, uh, like Europe and uh, uh, US, they, they, they kind of promoting the democracy uh, statements. But at the same time, this is happening in the world. Can we separate ourselves from the world or are we part of the world? So I think this is the important questions, even for, for whom they wanted to see the Syrian art, they are 
we are sharing this world. We are not integrating or they are not, we are coexisting. And in this coexistence, we know that why this is happening and we are all sharing this, whatever this, you know, the circumstances and the, that that's happening. So I think those questions are, are important, not who's they and who we are, why we are in this situation, all of us together. So this is uh, part of it. <laughs> Thank you. Kinan, what, did you want to add something to that? Um, yeah, it's, it's just because I think the whole idea is about perspective uh, too, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, again, about the labeling and everything. You know, pre-2011, and I've been in, in the U.S. for 20 years now, uh, when I go on tour uh, in, in small cities, I mean, it can be in the U.S., but it can be anywhere else in the world. And people ask, uh, you know, they come after the show and they say, where is Syria? Because they had no idea where Syria was. And sometimes they mix it, they confuse it with Siberia. I mean, it's... it's Serbia. Uh, it's, you know, yeah, yeah, everything. You get every version on the planet. And I used to, actually, it used to make me laugh, but, uh, but, but I mean, these people would be genuinely interested. So I will tell them, no, actually, it's Syria, you know, the Middle East, east of the Mediterranean, etc. 2011, and you, mean, you used the word rupture, which is a very true, uh, great word to use in this context. Suddenly, people have a very specific of the Syria they want to hear about. And, uh, and trying to connect that with the art you make did become difficult. Like for example, if I'm playing, and I tour you know, sometimes playing my own music and sometimes playing you know, pieces from the standard repertoire or pieces written for me by other composers. If as a, me as a Syrian clarinet player, if I'm playing the Mozart clarinet concerto with an orchestra in, in France, how, is that, how does it have an added value that I'm promoted as the Syrian clarinetist? Is it to bring an audience or is it to to say, well, he can play Mozart in spite of being Syrian. You know, there's all these, all these things that come to mind. And, uh, and it's been an incredible exercise of, uh, of patience and self-restraint to not engage in that kind of uh, rhetoric, you know? And also not to, uh, not to, fall, to, to fall victim to it. I think uh, many Syrian artists now receive invitations after invitation from people who had no interest in their art, you know, or maybe sometimes they don't even know what their art is about just because they have to fill a quota in a, in a, like a curated exhibition. Oh, we need a Syrian guy. So they go online like, okay, Syrian musician or Syrian artist. And, and this has been really interesting of how we have to, you know, fight that uh, as a collective. Mm, you can imagine that it's difficult to navigate these feelings. Um, maybe as a last takeaway, I wanted to um, come back to the uh, question on inspiration, but I just would like to know from both of you where you get your inspiration from. It can transcend Syria, of course, but um, where do you get your inspiration from artistically? Like what really fills your heart with joy or another emotion? It can be an unknown emotion. It can be questions, it can be yes. uh, um, a color, an idea, a new software that has been uh, created. So I think it's being conscious is the inspiration. It's like just trying, trying to be conscious around the things around you and feel how they affected you emotionally or intellectually and try to reflect with that. So it's a continuous uh, process of your relationship with the world around you, I think, in general. Yeah, I Sorry for being too much serious. I feel like the <laughs> conversation. <laughs> in in no, no. general, I'm less serious than that, but it's uh, Syrians. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I totally agree. No, no, this is, this is uh, I mean, absolutely true. In addition, I think there's the urgency. Uh, you know, sometimes you get obsessed with an idea. It just haunts you and you have to get it out of your system. And the only way you get it out of your system so you can move on with your life being obsessed with another thing is to actually, is to face it. And facing it is, you know, whether if you're a visual artist, you know, you put it on, on a medium in front of you as a musician, you just write the music and play that music. And, uh, and the inspiration can take the several forms. I think the most rewarding is the one that Sulafa talks about, the questioning, you know, trying to find an answer that will have nothing to do. Like, the search for the question, the answer doesn't matter actually. But the research you do for a project, many times, 
is the most gorgeous part of the of the whole thing actually which uh, unfortunately lots of the audience members will not even see because they see only the polished the project that's why seeing works in progress uh, for me now I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for sharing a works in progress because people can see the background of why you end up being obsessed with something yeah nice thank you so much Sulafa and Kinan for your energy your vibrance uh, the seriousness but there was also some joy and laughter which is uh, important to keep us going um, thanks and I do hope that we can have uh, some of these conversations live as well over a cup of nice coffee sometime and in the meantime I wish you all the best Thank you, Bridget. Thank and you, Bridget. Nice Thank to meet you, you Kinan, uh, online. <laughs> yes. And nice to meet yes. you. <laughs> soon, soon in person, I hope. Yeah, exactly. For all of us. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.